Tonight, Supergirl has a sassy computer house and I love everything about him. Nightwing is getting sued by the producers of Saw because that was just a blatant ripoff. And the outlaws are trying to magically forget their time with Scott Liddell. And frankly, I don't blame them. All that and more tonight on the Not So New 52. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 89 of the Not So New 52. I am your host and it is a bat themed week. It is there are more than 50% of the books coming out this week are in the Batman family of books. Now, none of them actually have Batman in them, which actually makes it more impressive that they've all managed to get shuffled into this week. And it's also true that there are only 11 books this week, so having half of them means only having six. But to have six Bat Family books all in one week, that's just poor on the editorial staff. Like, a major complaint of the New 52 was too many Bat books. And DC's like, nah, we got tons of other books you can read. And then you pull something like this. I guess this will be the test as to whether or not the audience of this show is actually looking forward to Bat books, because if not, this episode's going to do crap. Anyway, how about I tell you what books there are instead of just hinting at them lazily? So we have the 20th issues of Batgirl, Batwoman, Birds of Prey, Catwoman, Nightwing, and Red Hood and the Outlaws, all those Bat books. Additionally, we have the 20th issues of Supergirl, Wonder Woman, and Legion of Superheroes. We have the fourth issue of Justice League of America's Vibe, and we have the eighth and final issue of Sword of Sorcery, which I have been enjoying, so make sure you listen to that. However, some of you I know will say, wait a minute, hold on. Down in the show notes and the description of this podcast, you 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 say something after Sword of Sorcery. What is that? What am I looking at? And I say, very astute of you, single person who would do that. Turns out, my next two weeks are extremely busy. And that is both in front of this camera and behind the scenes. So I am going to take one of the backup stories that I would normally save for a fifth week, and I'm just going to do it now because it's my show and I can just do that. I have time. I have the ability. Why not? So look forward at the end of this show where I'm going to be covering the backup story from Sword of Sorcery called Stalker. I know that none of you have ever heard of Stalker before, and trying to sell that as if it's a big thing is probably poor marketing. But regardless, I'm sticking with it. So Stalker, grade A content. Anyway, we have a lot of Bat books to get through, so I think we should just go ahead and jump right into Batgirl. Batgirl number 20, written by Gail Simone, art by Daniel Sampier and Carlos Rodriguez. So, last issue, Barbara killed her brother, seemingly. And he definitely didn't show up in Suicide Squad this week. So, we open up this issue with, like, a brand new arc. Oh, and also her dad's now hunting her because she he saw her kill her brother. So, this issue picks up nine years ago. And it's at a children's birthday party, and all the children are making fun of this weird little girl named Shauna Belzer. And they're like, you suck, get out of here. And she goes over to the clown who's there, and the clown's name is Rainbow Rodney, and he's got a ventriloquist dummy. And he's like, hey, don't be so sad, little girl, turn that frown upside down. And Shauna looks at the punch bowl, and then looks at some nearby weed killer, and says, yeah, you know what, I think I'll do that. And then we see her parents coming to pick her up. And she's like, yeah, no, I had to go early because all the girls got really sick for some reason. And also, this party clown gave me his ventriloquist dummy. And we see the uh, dummy's name is Ferdy. And he's got, like, red stains all over his forehead. And the parents are like, is that, um, is that juice? And she's like, yeah, I guess, probably. Anyway, so cut to current day. 
We see a therapist pouring herself a cup of coffee and all of a sudden Barbara just storms into the room crying and she's like, I'm sorry, I, I should go. I don't have an appointment. I'm just so upset. And she's like, hey, hey, no, no, it's cool. Have you been drinking? And she's like, I've been doing a lot of things I never thought I'd do. So at that point, she she's she couches it in like metaphor and double talk, but she's like, yeah, no, I... I was uh, doing some volunteer work and I looked at my uniform and it's like I didn't even recognize myself anymore. So I put myself into exile and we see that what that means is that she used some scissors to cut out the emblem of the bat on her chest. So then she goes back out uh, into the city and she's basically out on patrol and she gets to this place where there's a lot of stuff going on and she's like, oh right, I completely forgot. There's Gotham's Got a Star auditions going on, which is just America's Got Talent, but for Gotham and copyright free. And we see this line going around the block, but inside currently auditioning is Shauna along with Ferdy, now grown up. And Ferdy keeps on making really distasteful jokes. Like, I'll just throw one out here. Uh, I had a date. We had, she said we had to practice safe sex. I said I wasn't so scared she'd give me cooties as that I'd give her termites. But um, tis. So at that point, the uh, judges are like, um, okay, well, you know, it, it's good. It's an okay gig, but you're not really the right fit for this show. And then the one who's supposed to be Simon Cowell chimes up and is just like, no, nah, you suck. Like, you, you show up here in rattered, ratty old, like, rags. You make these horrible jokes and and you look like you haven't eaten in like 20 years like you look gross so and plus i could see your lips move and that seems the thing that ticks her off and all of a sudden she tells everyone like oh wait hold on you know what let me try again and she's like what's that ferdy what's that oh hey mr judge guy ferdy wants to give you a hug and so she pushes the puppet out onto this judge and then two drill bits appear from its palms and he just drives them into the judge's neck causing him to immediately start bleeding out so then some security guards step up step up and they're like hey ma'am you're gonna have to come with us and somehow their tasers activate without being touched at all so at that point Batgirl's like okay hold on I'm hearing screaming what's going on and we see Shauna is leading Ferdy into leading one of the remaining judges to tell everyone, you know, get out of here. Or no, actually saying, come inside. We're going to judge all of you. And everyone starts running away because they realize, yeah, this is probably, a, this is a trap. We're going to leave. And Batgirl follows them into a parking garage. And she recognizes this as the same parking garage that she met up with Ricky, like, seven issues ago and we cut over to ricky who has apparently gotten a new titanium leg and his brother's like hey where are you going he's like oh i'm going out uh, i got a date with barbara gordon i guess that happened somewhere along the way and the brother basically chews him out for staying faithful to like being a friend of batgirl because he's a criminal and he's like oh no criminals are on the side of the bats Anyway, that doesn't really come back up. But we do cut over to Nightfall, who was the one girl who was just a total psychopath. She got out of jail. She's still running her place. And they get the call that, hey, Batgirl is in this building. Let's deal with her. So at this point, we see uh, Batgirl go and confront Ferdy and Shauna. And they she does end up just giving herself the name of the ventriloquist at this point. She's like, oh, I'm, I'm better than any other ventriloquist. I'm the ventriloquist. So I'm just going to call her that from now on. And she looks like she's about to use the same drill thing into the judge's neck. Barbara's like, oh, no, I have to use a battering. But that's what hurt my brother last time. Oh, well, got to do it. And as she throws it, it stops in midair. And it seems that Shauna is able to control it with her mind she has telekinetic abilities so she throws it back at batgirl ferdy then just leaps at batgirl without shauna behind him at all and starts trying to use the drill hands on her she's like ah oh, geez christ that's insane what's going on here the cops show up the more security guards and ventriloquist fakes the judge's voice into saying batgirl's the one who kidnapped me arrest her so now all the security guards are going after batgirl as uh, ventriloquist just leads uh, the judge away so Batgirl's like ah crap I 
uh, these cop, these rented cops are getting in my way. I got to get to the judge quickly or else. And as she's kicking the security guards' butts, it turns out that Shauna did get away and the judge is nowhere to be seen. So let me cut back to the therapist thing and therapist is just like, okay, well, that was a lot of metaphors and stuff like that and you didn't quite tell me exactly what's going on, but do you feel like you put yourself into dangerous behavior to like punish yourself? And then all of a sudden Barbara just clicks like, wait a minute, hold on, I have an eidetic memory and I saw all the license plates in the garage that she was walking towards. I'll just run those. Doy. And so she runs out of the room and the therapist is like, um, okay, see you at our next meeting, I guess. So then we go to the Gotham suburbs and we see Ventriloquist is talking to the judge and just like, you know, so many people want to go on that show to be like famous for being a singer or whatever. But who's really more famous? Those random singers who have one hit wonders and then die off or people like the Joker or the Penguin. I want to be famous like them, people that no one's ever going to forget. And we see the judges all tied up and Shauna's parents are on either side, but they have also been murdered and turned into puppets. So, yeah. And then final page, we see back out at the pier where Batgirl, quote unquote, killed her brother. Uh, Gordon and the GCPD are just sweeping the all the water around him looking for a body. And Gordon swears, I will bring in Batgirl. She is going to pay for killing my son. So... It's fine. It's I, I like the introduction of this new ventriloquist. Um, it's an interesting backstory, possibly a bit too zany for me. I'm sure what we'll end up finding out is that Ferdy actually has some powers as well, because isn't it always that the dummy is the one really calling the shots? As for the framing device of the therapist and like her feeling guilty over theoretically killing her brother... Yes, I get it, and it hits, but at the same time, as I hinted in the beginning, Suicide Squad number 20 already showed and came out that he's alive, so I'm not all that, like, twinged about it. It seems, it almost hits a bit lesser because they let this come out after that. So, overall, art's fine. It It's stronger in some places rather than others, but I gotta give this one, like, a, I don't know. It's like a 6.5. It's not bad, but it does feel a bit too much going. I think I could have done without the therapist framing device is really what's hitting me. Because that just didn't amount to anything save for allowing her to retell the story, which you could have just told it. You didn't have to retell it. So, yeah, 6.5. Batwoman number 20, written by J.H. Williams III and W. Hayden Blackman, art by Trevor McCarthy. So, last issue, they basically tried to rope in Batwoman, the DEO did, and they revealed to her, hey, your sister's still alive. And this issue just picks up immediately afterwards, where she's like, no, there's no, you. this is Clayface or some other, like, hologram crap. There's no way my sister's still alive. And they're like, no, 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 she is. Allow me to give you the backstory on how we found her. And Chase starts going into this whole thing of, we've been trying to unmask you for weeks. We always suspected that it was you, considering that your dad is the one who took the fall for Batwoman. But, like, we weren't sure. But either way, we were investigating everything we could. We came across this religion of crime, like, splinter cell like a group that was absolutely obsessed with you to the point where they had a whole bunch of like training dummies made to look like you kind of creepy honestly but either way we made our way in we thought that they had all bailed out when they heard our chopper coming in turns out bad intel because as soon as we came into the room they started firing on us and we threw down some gas that would take them out but it still wasn't all of them and we started suffering heavy losses as we made our way through and chase lays down the fact of like they started opening fire on us they did not care if they died they their only goal was to make sure we were dead as well so all of my teammates started going down and i should have gone down as well but for some reason i didn't and i still don't know why but regardless i called it in and what we found was this giant sarcophagus there. And we ran some scans on it. And what we found out was that your sister was brought back to life inside. She was in some sort of like stasis thing 
We don't get it. Maybe it's magic. Maybe it's nanobots. But point being, she was in there. And we only opened it up after your fight with Medusa when you refused to give us the intel you got on Wonder Woman. And immediately Batwoman's pissed off by that. It's like, you've had her alive in this coffin all this time and you didn't bring her back? And she starts... She like goes to punch Bones in the face. Chase pulls the gun. She kicks Chase in the face and just starts going after him. And at that point, she's like, okay, look, here's the thing. We'll give you back your sister. Like, that's fine. However, you have to give us something equally of value in return. And she's like, first things first, I'm getting a face-to-face with her. You're giving me that just off the top. So we see uh, Kate goes into the room and she takes off her mask and she sits down with Alice and they say hey to each other. And she gets five minutes with her. And it looks like they just spend the whole thing hugging. Until finally someone comes in and is just like, hey, you're out of time. We got to go. So Alice says, like, don't don't let them put me back in the dark. And she's like, I promise you I'm coming for you. Just you got to give me some more time. And so they put her back into basically a holding cell. And then night comes and they explain the deal. So Kate will get back Alice and she will be free of the DEO forever. She never has to do any more work to them on the condition that she provides Batman's true identity. So she's like, all right, Batman for my family. That's the deal. I, I, I'll do it. And so she shakes on it and asks DEO for a couple different things. They say uh, Scarecrow sleep toxin is the one thing that she really needs. And as she goes off, they're like, do you really think she's going to, She's going to get Batman's identity. And Bones is like, I don't know. She's going to die trying at least. So she gets back to her new penthouse that she has with Maggie. And inside is her entire family. Uh, Her dad, her stepmom, I guess, Bet is there. And they're all like, hey, um, Bet put a bug on you when you last split up and the DEO didn't find it. So is your sister really alive? Because we heard all of that. And immediately, Kate unleashes on her dad because he knows she knows that he's behind it. And she's like, look, I don't like I don't care about any of that. You can yell at me all you want. But is my daughter still alive? And Catherine, the stepmom, steps up just being like, look, I didn't even know about any of this stuff beforehand. I, I, I'm now just a part of it. And Kate's like, why are you even here? Get out of here. You're not you're not important. And. Basically, everyone wants to help. Everyone's like, if this is the way we can get your sister back, we are 100% in, like, with whatever you need. And Kate just shoots him down and be like, no, nobody else is getting involved in this. This is my thing. I have to do it. I'm not letting anyone else get hurt. And Maggie basically chimes up being like, stop being such a goddamn martyr and just let your family help you. Because if you don't, I'm packing my bags and I'm out of here tonight. And Kate's like, Okay, fine. I guess everyone's going to help. So that's where we leave the issue, is everyone now knows that Alice is alive. I mean, her real name's Beth. I call her Alice because she does the whole Alice in Wonderland thing. But it's Beth. I know that. So I think that this issue probably did the most legwork out of, like, the past three issues in making something big happen. Uh, Because last issue, it definitely felt... Kind of like we were just getting everything back into place of, okay, we're setting up that she has a new apartment. We're setting up that the DEO has Beth and all this extra stuff. This one feels like, okay, here's the big thing. Here is what we're doing. And we are going to move forward with it in it's the whole Batwoman family to get Batman's identity to take on the DEO. I'm I'm totally down for that. I'm definitely enjoying it. Uh, Art-wise, it doesn't do as crazy of layouts as I usually get from this book, but that's just because Trevor McCarthy's the one on art. Not bad with what I got, though. Um, yeah, it's it's just a solid issue. Not anything amazing, but just a nice solid issue. I will say the standout to it is Kate meeting up with Beth in the big white room because it's almost completely silent. It's just all told through faces and layouts and stuff like that. So I'll give this one a... I'll give it a flat seven. It's good. It's a nice book. I'm not hating on it, but it's definitely just setting up for bigger things to happen in the future. So looking forward to that. (music) 
Birds of Prey, number 20, written by Christy Marks, art by Romano Molinar. So last issue, we found out that Starling betrayed the team, and she is working with Mr. Freeze. This issue just kind of stays in place, but explains it ever so slightly more. So Black Canary is our narrator, as always, and she's just like, you know, I work on Black Op teams, and, and they always tell you never, ever trust people, because you'll always get betrayed. I guess I just never expected it from this. And then we see, yes, it's actually true, Starling standing off the side. Uh, Strix is completely frozen in ice. Everyone else is kind of just standing around at the moment. And Black Canary reasons out like, okay, Batgirl's standing closest to Strix. She'll find a way to get her out of that. I just need to stall for time. So she calls out Starling and just like, how could you set us up, Starling? What, how long have you even been working with Mr. Freeze? And he, she's like, oh, this, I mean, like, this is just temporary. This is just recently. But like, we go way back. I owed him, he owed me. And right now he just called in a favor. And we see Batgirl starts melting out Strix as best she can. Meanwhile, the Court of Owl scientists are just kind of standing in the back like, should we... Should we go? Should we leave? I, I mean, I don't know. So, the Starling explains how Freeze had his text stolen by the Court of Owls for their talons, and he wouldn't pay back or whatever. And they, she tries to reason out, like, look, you guys hate the Court of Owls. Freeze hates the Court of Owls. We're all on the same side here. It's just against the Court of Owls. And... They're like, no, that's not really how that works. You you stabbed us in the back. Like, you you betrayed us here. And she's like, no, I, like, we're working together against the Court of Owls. That's what we're trying to do here. So, yeah, no, we're still on good terms, if, unless you make it weird. And, of course, at that point, uh, they say, like, no, we'll never work with Mr. Freeze. And so is like, okay, well, Batgirl's probably almost broken out Strix. So, Mr. Freeze, could you please refreeze them again? And so she gets refrozen again. The scientists finally bail in all the hecticness. They try to run out. Um, Starling tries to shoot the scientists as they run out. Condor uses his telekinetic ability to move the bullets out of the way. And then it's just a big fight scene. So it's Starling versus Batgirl. And they just go at each other, punching each other. And then Condor and canary go after freeze and he just makes a big wall of ice to keep them away as he goes after the scientists so at that point we see the fight between starling and batgirl is basically batgirl saying like you're a traitor and starling's like yeah and like I, i'm doing this because i i i know who i am like i don't care what you have to say about it so then we see Condor's trying to use his ability to break through the ice. It's not working, so he says, you gotta use a canary cry. And she says no, because of course she's afraid of using her ability anymore. And Condor's like, oh, don't, like, don't worry about me, I, I, I can easily take care of it. And she's like, no, no, the shrapnel from the ice could hurt you. Anyway, I brought along Thermite, because I figured, Mr. Freeze, let's just use Thermite. And Condor calls him out like, you know, I can help you. I know you're afraid of losing control. And she's like, mm, let's not, let's focus on just using the thermite. So they set off the bombs. It melts through the ice. And then we see the scientists have made their way down into a stairwell. And they say, we got to warn the grandmaster, the grandmaster of the court. Got to call him. So they call him up and they say, hey, uh, Mr. Freeze is here. Strick showed up. There's like... It's a lot of issues going on. And the Grandmaster's like, oh, did you say Strix? Did you say Mary, to the defective one? Yeah, go ahead and keep her there. Uh, I'll be in touch. And they're like, we're trying to leave, man. But he hangs up. At that point, Mr. Freeze shows up and threatens the female scientist. And he's just like, you have no right. We, we may have taken your research, but we have expanded upon it a hundredfold. Your stuff is barely even useful anymore. And he's like, that's fair. So tell me how you managed to revive them. And they're like, well, we're not going to tell you that. That's our research. And he's like, oh, so now you care about that stuff. So he takes the female scientist and says, tell me it or I'm going to freeze your eyes out of your socket. And then he gets a bit overzealous and does it anyway. And the other scientist is like, you killed her. And he's like, oops, my bad. Well, luckily there's another one. Yeah, tell me how you do it. And he says, the key is a metal alloy. It's called Electrum. And he's like, 
cool. Tell me everything about Electrum. And so we don't see that conversation happen, but he tells Starling like, hey, I got what I needed. Let's go to the rendezvous point. So immediately Starling starts trying to bail. The entire team tries to hold her back, but she manages to slip away. And as she's making her way down a hallway, Canary's like, oh God, I got to use my power to stop her. I hope this doesn't kill anybody. And so she uses Canary Cry. The whole tunnel comes down, but it looks as though she's made it through uh, unscathed. And so they're like, crap. All right, well, let's start using more thermite. And then they look over at Strix, who's still frozen. And Batgirl's like, hey, if you use your Canary Cry, you could just break her out. And Canary's like, um, I also could shatter her into a million pieces. And Batgirl reminds her, you just used like a full powered one. You probably don't have that much energy. Just do it right now, real quick. And she's like, all right, I mean, sure, whatever. So she uses it. Strix gets free. And Batgirl's like, I'm going to take her out into the sun so she can warm up. You guys try to go after Starling as best you can. And we don't follow them. We follow Batgirl, who makes her way up onto a rooftop. And Strix starts coming to... And then all of a sudden a shadow's cast over them. And turns out it's Calvin Rose, the rogue Talon from the book Talon. He's here. Because he has a gripe against the Court of Owls as well. So, to be fair, I like that book. And I am okay with it crossing over into Birds of Prey. Especially with Christy Marks now at the helm. Because I really actually like the way she's directing this book. In that, you know, it makes sense. So, I mean, I'm, I just enjoyed the issue. I think that it didn't do much of anything. I think it basically everything in the plot of this book could have been handled in maybe three pages of you betrayed us, Mr. Freeze got more info, and then they left the building. That's all that really happened. So kind of a bit too decompressed for me, but it still is an okay issue. Overall, I'll give it a... I'm going to give it a six, and I know that sounds harsh after what I just said, but it's also, I'm I'm kind of getting tired of Black Canary being like, oh no, my power, I can't, what will I ever do? I could hurt people with a superpower. Yeah, yeah, you can. Everyone, every superpower comes with the thing of it could hurt somebody. Get over it. It's just being stretched a bit too thin here. I want her to move past this, but I'm sure that'll come sooner rather than later. So for now, it's a six. Catwoman number 20, written by Anne Nascenti, art by Rafa Sandoval, Diogenes Nevis, and Mateus Santaluco. So last issue was a tie-in, quote-unquote, with JLA, Justice League of America number three, I believe. And I thought that it would tie in heavily because at the very end, she ended up in the Gotham Underground after breaking out of Arkham. Then this issue happens, and I gave the book way too much credit. So we pick up with Penguin visiting his mother in the family crypt. And I guess it's in the Gotham Underground because Catwoman's just there, and she's like... Oh, hey, he left a bunch of jewels in there with her. I'm going to go get those. And she talks about how impossible it is to break the lock. And then she does it anyway. And as she's about to break in, she gets punched in the face by some dude who's down there. And she's like, hey, wait a minute. I know you. We met in the black room, which I don't remember him. I have, I like, maybe... But I don't remember him. But either way, she beats him up. And she's he's like, oh, what did you do to me? My, my body is changing and it hurts. And if I remember correctly, at the end of the issue prior to last, this is the guy who was walking down the street and he had like horns growing out of his head. So either way, she just walks off with some of the jewels and says, ah, I'm busy stealing from your boss. Tell, tell him the message that I'm doing so. And so... He tells Penguin the message and says, like, oh, a tech guy, make some drones that are going to shoot at Catwoman anytime she shows up anywhere. And he's like, on it, boss. So then we go to Selena's penthouse, and she is watching over the footage that she's getting from the police station because she planted a bug there. And her partner, Gwen, is like, you can't, that's illegal. And she's like, what, are you serious? That's like 95% of what I do. 
And then she claims, I also stole these from Cobblepot. And she's like, you stole from, you got to give those back immediately. You don't understand. And Gwen basically breaks down and says, yeah, he's the one who bailed me out of jail. And he's got his finger in everything. Like, we, we got to play by his rules right now. And Catwoman's like, I don't play by anyone's rules. So maybe me and you got to go our different ways. So then we see the Rat Tails gang is being trained on how to shoot better. And Catwoman just shows up and says, hey... Uh, I hear that Black Mask has a whole bunch of, like, jewels and stuff under the city. You know anything about that? And it's just like, yeah, but it's not, it's more than you can get with just this shovel. So then we go over to the home of Joe Pazzo, who's the dude that stopped Catwoman from breaking into the vault at the beginning. And he's like, I've been going through some weird changes, some weird things are going on with me. And his daughter keeps on laughing at, like, a silly face he makes. And he's just like, stop laughing, baby. It's not funny. And he's like, oh, I can't stop laughing. Ha ha ha. It hurts, daddy. And eventually he smacks his daughter and the mother's like, what in the hell is wrong with you? And he's like, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea why I do that. So Catwoman calls up Darwin, the guy from the black room. Can I just, can I just throw out there right now? If I had known how much we would keep going back to that black room thing because it actually ended up being important rather than just a stupid little tie into black diamond probability i would be so much more pissed off back then because i still didn't know what was happening so either way she calls him up and says like hey remember that demon thing from that those issues is he still out and he's like yes his name is escalate he just makes human emotion go way over the top whether that be happiness or fear or lust or whatever and she's like, okay, well, I'll figure out how to take care of it. And we see Pazzo with Escalate inside of him, because of course it is, is standing watching her outside a bar. And she's like, he's like, I gotta, I, I can't attack her with all the people in there. I'll get her outside by getting all the men in there to be super creepy. So he escalates their lust and they all start hitting on Catwoman. But then they also start just committing sexual assault. And she starts beating the crap out of all of them. And as she puts on her mask, Escalate just breaks in through the window and says like, well, that's enough of that. And then she's like, well, hold on, wait a minute. I recognize your face. I literally just beat you up the other night. So are we going to fight? And he's like, yep, but let's do it somewhere else. And so they just leave. And then nobody has any memory of everything. And Escalate points out, like, don't worry. They'll all have their memories wiped from things when I'm interfering with them. So, like, it doesn't have anything to you don't have to worry about that which i wasn't to begin with but either way they make their way out to a beach and very quickly joe pazzo's body is being transformed into just full demonic form and he's like you messed something up with i was happy in my book and now i'm I'm this i'm turning in this guy but like it's also from the voice of joe pazzo so like he doesn't even realize that he's saying this he's like why did you mess me up why am i turning into a demon it just like randomly changes. So either way, his anger and his upsetness that his life has been ripped away from him spreads out to everyone else and everyone at the beach starts drowning themselves because they're so upset. And he's like, no, I'm not, I won't stop them, Catwoman. And he's like, you've got to. And she says, you just, whenever you're sad, just... Think of the opposite. Like, thanks, Dr. Catwoman, my depression is cured. So either way, it doesn't work. And she realizes the only way she's going to stop him is lethally. So she throws something, and it's like the worst sequence of panels in this whole book here. She throws something into his neck. He bleeds out, and as he dies, he transforms back into a normal person. And everyone just sees this dead person at the feet of Catwoman. They're like, Catwoman just killed a guy. A normal, innocent, totally not demonic guy. Murderer. And so now she's on the run. We see Penguin's guys come in in a helicopter to basically try to save his life. And Catwoman's like, am I do that? Did I do that? And then we just get Penguin, who's now extremely pissed off because not only did Catwoman steal from from him, she also killed one of his top guys. And so 
now they're going to rain bombs down on the Badlands, which is where I guess Catwoman is chilling. I just like this book so much. Not not just this issue. This issue is okay in just it's contained to itself. But from issue to issue, I constantly feel like I'm missing something. Like, I, there's just some hidden link. Like, I'm supposed to be reading some other series that's going to fill in all these gaps. And at first I thought maybe it'll be JLA. But no, this has nothing to do with any of that. They even specifically reference at one point, hey, JLA was calling for you. And she's just like, yeah whatever like it's 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 baffling to me how disjointed this story is and like nothing makes any sense from book to book and yet somehow all of it is supposedly have been set up in advance i'm so annoyed with this book this book escalates my annoyance so overall i'm gonna give this one a i'm gonna give it a four which is by far more than it deserves but I at least appreciated the art. The art looked nice in this issue, which is more than I could say for a lot of the issues in this run. So, God, I dislike it. Nightwing number 20, written by Kyle Higgins, art by Brett Booth. So last issue, Nightwing arrived in Chicago he crashed a helicopter into a newly opened train station by oopsies. And we also saw Tony Zuko's alive, but is like buddy buddies with the mayor. And there's a villain who's attacking rich people named Prankster. There was a lot. There's a lot going on. So at this point, it's next morning. Nightwing's like, whew, boy, I, I goofed up with that whole helicopter crash. And he arrives back at the apartment that he is renting. He crashes in bed and Immediately, he's awoken with a foot to the chest and a screaming woman. And apparently, this woman's name is Joey. And she is the person who usually rents the room. She was supposed to be gone this month, which is why it was subletted out. But she didn't leave. And so she attacks Nightwing, thinking, sorry, Dick, thinking that he is a, you know, burglar or creep who breaks in. And she immediately is apologizing. And he's like, nah, it's, it's, it's cool. It's fine. Like, I'll just... I'll go sleep on the couch. It's all good. No problem. So he goes out. He sleeps elsewhere. We see at the Steelworks building, police arrive because of pranksters, quote unquote, prank on the rich guy who was embezzling funds or something from the city. And it turns out that the wolf that he was with, I'm not going to explain, just check out last issue, is eating his arm. His arm has been fully chewed off. And the guy's like, please help me. I'm going to die. So at that point, Nightwing awakes to a loud thud noise repeatedly and turns out that Joey is a programmer and people are whining to her about like their passwords being leaked and stuff like that, even though she told them it was a security issue beforehand. And she's throwing a tennis ball against the wall in frustration. And she's like, oh, geez, I'm sorry I woke you up. I, we're really getting off to a bad start, aren't we? And she's like, hey, as long as you're not kicking my ass anymore, I'm good. So then the... uh the guy who rented the room shows up, and I'm not even sure he has a name. Uh, he, 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 yeah, he doesn't have a name. So he's all pissed off because, like, oh, yeah, no, the, the Nightwing showed up and blew up our train station. Why, why, all those superheroes and masks, they make things worse for everyone else. And Dick's like, ah, oh, I mean, I'm sure he had a good reason for it. <clears throat> So at this point, he gets a text from Johnny Spade, who's the guy he talked to last night about getting some info on Tony Zuko, saying to meet him somewhere. So we go to City Hall, and we see the police sergeant is giving the breakdown on that embezzling guy and prankster and all that. And he's like, yeah, we, uh, we found out that he totally was embezzling based off prankster's evidence, and he, he probably got better than he deserved with how much he took from our city. And the mayor's like, okay, well, why is he to why torturing politicians is still a bad thing? Like we shouldn't embrace that, Sergeant. No matter if they're guilty or not. Um, also, my guy said something about a Tony Zuko. You know what's up with that? And the Sergeant's like, that must have been a bad lead. He he died for sure. He's definitely not alive. And so the Sergeant walks off, and Tony Zuko immediately walks in, and he's like, Ah, oh, geez, Mayor, you gotta help me. Last time Nightwing was on my tail, I had to leave town. I had to leave my daughter. I am. A heartbroken man, Mr. Mayor, you got to protect me from the scourge that is Nightwing. 
And the mayor's like, yeah, no, don't don't worry. We are on it. We will take care. You are safe. So Nightwing goes back out and he meets up with Johnny Spade on top of a rooftop. And uh, Johnny's like, OK, here's the deal. We're going to play some cards. If you win, I'll tell you what I know about Zuko. And if I win, you have to tell me why you're interested in him. And Nightwing's like, uh, what does that matter? And he's like, oh, I, I deal in information. Anything you can give me. I'll just, ooh, I love it. So they play cards, and Nightwing immediately starts reading him, like a slight sweat, a tiny tremble. He's immediately uh, going to win this game. And so he tells Nightwing, yeah, I played cards against this guy. All I could get from him was that there is a building, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and the security guard was told not to come to work that night. He was told to leave it uncovered. So whatever's going to happen is going to happen there. So we cut over to there and we see another dude who designs, um, what's it called? Insulation, like lightning insulation to protect people's homes from lightning. And it's a scam. He knows it doesn't work and that those things will actually kill him. So Prankster has jigsawed this guy and has put him into his own lightning insulator and is going to fire off lightning at him. And if he isn't scamming people, he'll live. But if he is, then he'll die. And so he lights up the Tesla coil and then Nightwing breaks in and immediately just saves the guy. And he's like, hey, Prankster, I, I was wondering when we'd meet. And Prankster's like, oh, hey, Nightwing, what's what's you, you showing up at a really bad time. And Nightwing just tells him, okay, here's the thing. Either you can give up and we both walk out of here together, or I drag you out. So what's it going to be? And Prince is like, ah, come on. I thought you were cool. I thought we were going to be cool. Uh, whatever. So he just presses a button on his, like, little screen pad. And all of a sudden, Nightwing's visor, his, like, heads-up display, goes pitch black. He's unable to see. And he's like, anything that's tech-related I can get into. And... Your eyes, your little scanners or whatever, and your retinas, they have tech. So, yeah, you're running blind. But Nightwing's able to use just some audio cues in order to still manage to get a few hits off on Prankster, even break his mask a little bit. And Prankster's like, okay, all right, fair enough. I gave you a bit too much rope. So he turns back on the Tesla coil, which makes a loud electricity sound that Nightwing can't hear anything over. And Prankster pushes him into an airtight cage or airtight cage. And he's like, all right, Nightwing, I want to play a game. You have two hatches at your feet. One of them will lead to safety and will shut off this fire that I am going that I have lit in the room. The other one is open will open up oxygen into the room and you will immediately catch on fire. You are unable to see anything, so therefore the only way out is to take off your mask, and we see Prankster is filming it, so he's going to reveal Nightwing's identity to the world if he wants to live. That's the that's the cliffhanger. That's how we end. I gotta have to say, I don't feel like pretty much anything happened this issue. It kind of just feels like we mostly stayed in place. I think the biggest issue comes from We've got the prankster plot going on, which is clearly what we want to focus on at this point. Whereas the larger plot of Tony Zuko is still eating up like four pages of this book. So I want it to focus on the Zuko stuff. Don't get me wrong. The prankster stuff is interesting. Ignoring the fact how he is just Jigsaw. Like, exactly. The... the Zuko stuff is what I was promised, and it, while it is getting some interesting developments in that Zuko seems genuinely afraid of Nightwing messing up his life some more, like he feels like he turned a corner, at least it's written that way, I'm not getting enough of it that I feel like it's the main plot. The main plot is clearly this prankster stuff, and eh, it's fine. It's not great. I'm just... I, I, I was promised the Zuko stuff, I guess, is the main thing. I'm not... I guess my biggest problem here is... I'm waiting for Nightwing to go back to Gotham. Whereas it's obvious that the books wants to spend a lot of time in Chicago. And I'm not interested in that yet. And it hasn't made me interested in that yet. So once we set down permanent roots here in Chicago, I'll be more interested in let's find a rogues gallery here in the second city. But we're not there yet. And I just want him to get on the reason that he was here. So overall, I'm going to give it a... 
I'll give it a flat seven. It's okay, not great for all the reasons I just said. So yeah, and on, on, I don't feel like I have to say this, the Brett Booth art, not a positive. Red Hood and the Outlaws, number 20, written by James Tynion IV, art by Julius Gopez. So, last issue, the Outlaws discovered that Jason Todd has wiped his memory clean because he told this weird memory-wiping kid, hey, I want you to wipe my memories of everything connected to the darkness. And this issue picks up with Roy and Starfire being understandably pissed off that this guy has done this stuff because they're like, that's clearly not what he meant. He didn't mean everything, but the kid's are like, okay, well, hold on. Let's ask him, how do you feel? And Jason's like, you know, I, I feel pretty good. I feel like this weight has been lifted off of me. I feel freer than I've ever been. And Starfire's like, I mean, he does seem pretty good. And Roy's like, shut, no, he, he doesn't even know who he is. This is awful. And so he goes up to the kid and he's like, why did you, you know, this isn't what he meant. This is a monkey's paw crap. And the kid's like, no, he said everything connected to the darkness. And maybe you don't understand how, like, the human mind works, but you build off of previous memories and that impacts you. Like, everything is connected. So I had to erase everything. And he's like, okay, what are you up to? Like, clearly you're up to something, kid. Like, what is it? And he's like, I, I have nothing to gain from this. I was just helping out. What, what do you think I'd care that he wanted to forget? And... He's like, you know what? How about that? I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show you his life, just how dark it was. And we get all the greatest hits from his life of, you know, killed by the Joker. His mom died in an overdose or whatever. Uh, his He was awoken by Talia from death. He is in the all cast and he sees that the Joker went free and then he became Red Hood and came back to Gotham. And then Joker says, oh, yeah, I, I led your life. I'm the reason that you exist. And... Roy points out, like, look, stop. We are stronger to get. We make him a better person. So clearly, that is what he would have wanted, to be a better person with us. And he's just like, are you sure? You positive about that? Because let me show you the first night you met Jason. And Roy, he's already a junkie and all that. He's already off the wagon. And he's getting beat up by a bunch of uh, thugs. And then Robin comes in. Jason Todd is Robin. And he takes out the uh, thugs and he's like, hey, you're Roy Harper, aren't you? I hear you're uh, going through some bad stuff. And I just want you to know, I'm here for you. If you ever need a friend, just call on me, Robin. Because Dick Grayson spoke very highly of you. And he's like, oh, okay. Uh, I don't need friends, though. I'm, I'm, I'm totally good on my own. I'm better alone. And he's like, oh, Roy, we all need friends. And then he ropes away and... Roy's like, yeah, see, we all need friends. That's it. He said the words. And he's like, oh, but did he tell you what happened right after that? Because as soon as he left you alone, he found out that his mom was still alive and then the Joker was waiting to kill him. So that was a bad night for him, actually. Like, yes, the first night he met you, it was a bad night. And Roy's like, oh, he never told me that. He, he, he. I thought he just didn't want to remind me of how I was a junkie. I didn't realize he had his own problems. And it's like, yeah, no, he didn't tell you a lot of stuff, Roy. There's a lot going on with him. In fact, let me show you what happens after he came back from death. Because he, it wasn't just, oh, he was in the all cast and then he just showed up as Red Hood. Like, he had to find his way once he wanted to become Red Hood. He had to learn how to kill. And apparently he joined, like, a mercenary group. And he thought he was going in there to extract justice on people. But it turns out that the group was actually after just like riches and gold and stuff like that. And after they burned down an entire village, he's like, I don't want to do this. This is bad. I feel evil. And so the kid closes off the memories and he's just like, oh, he was hurt. And we weren't there for him. We didn't know. How could we have known? And because it's like, he doesn't want you to know. And now he doesn't want to know himself. That's why I wiped the memories. Can we please get off of that? And Starfire then chimes in. And he's like, oh, but what about this? And she's like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to stop you right there, honey. You have more buried memories and like crap like that than I can even begin to get through. You know, let me just, let me just pull open a few just to show Roy, how much of a lie you've been hiding. And 
she she gets really pissed off. She's about to attack the guy. But then he opens up a memory of Starfire fighting against Dick Grayson for some reason. And at that point, she starts letting off energy beams. Roy is away for like pulls Jason away, pulls him down. And Jason's like, guys, stop this. All of you, you have to understand if I asked for this, if this is something I wanted, then it's something I wanted. Please just respect that decision that your old friend made. And Roy says, no, screw that. And he tranks him and says, I'm going to get your memories back. Don't worry, buddy. And so he starts to threaten the kid and kids just like, Okay, well, here's the thing. The only one who can ask for it back is the dude you just tranked. So clearly that's not going to happen. And he fires off an arrow at the kid. And he's just like, yeah, no, that's not going to. He just like swats it away. He's like, yeah, okay. I'm done being yelled at by you idiots. Uh, I'm going to go. Let me know if you would like any of your bad memories erased. Okay, bye. And he just teleports them out. And... Starfire, they all get teleported back out into the wilderness, like snowy and all that stuff. Starfire's like, all right, what's the plan? He's like, plan? I don't That was the plan. The plan was to go get him. Now we have him. I don't have a plan. Also, you've always told me that you think, like, you feel and remember stuff differently and that all humans look the same, but you clearly have memories of Dick Grayson. Did you lie to me? Did you, did, were you just, like, trying to keep me at arm's length or, like, make me feel better that if I, like, if you left one, what is this? Our entire team has fallen apart with lies. What is going on here? And I do just want to throw out that in the middle of all this, the kid gave Roy a new hat that just says the word dunce across it. Nowhere else I could fit that in, but I really enjoy it. So then we see Essence and I can't remember her name, but the leader of the all cast. And they're both looking over them from a peak. And then the kid shows up. And it turns out that Dukra, that's her name, Dukra, and the kid are actually planning something that's basically just going to break them down and build that back up again. So Essence is like, this is stupid. We can all see the flow of time. And this is like how people die. We can all, people will die because of your actions today. You both suck. I'm out. So then we go to Seattle for just the last page thing. Dude's at his computer eating pizza. He gets shot in the shoulder by a Green Arrow. No points for guessing who that is. And Green Arrow's like, hey, I heard that there's a bounty on these three guys. How much is it up to? Because this guy's in on that, I guess. He's a bounty hunter. And apparently it's like $350 million or something like that. And the Green Arrow's like, ah, crap. Roy, you really stepped in it this time. Guess I'm going to have to clean up your mess again. So now Green Arrow is on the case to save Roy or get him off of the bounty hunters list because the outlaws pissed people off. I don't know. There's a lot going on. Here's the thing. I can appreciate from James Tynion coming in and saying, okay, I need to break this team down so I can build it back up in a new way. There's a lot of baggage that was coming with Red Hood. There's a lot of baggage coming with Starfire and a lot of baggage coming with Arsenal. All because of Lobdell's run. So I appreciate him coming in and saying, I'm not undoing it, but I'm also going to allow the team to have a new structure and a new dynamic. And I see that and I like that. That being said, I really wish he would have thought of a different way than total amnesia because it just, it hits me wrong. There's no, I've barely ever seen a plot where amnesia turns out to be like a really good idea. So yeah, it's not a bad issue by any means, but it is kind of just, hey, let's just sit down and take a look at the team and just reevaluate what everybody is doing with here. So I'm going to give this one a, God, it's hard, but I'm going to say a 6.5. It's almost at that 7. It's nearly there, but I just I don't feel right saying 7. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how Tiny managed to pull out all this. The fact he's pulling in Green Arrow, good luck to you. I, I'm hoping that it's closer to the way that Lemire is currently doing it rather than Anne Nascenti before him. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic.
Supergirl number 20, written by Michael Allen Nelson, art by Mahmoud Azrar. So last issue, Supergirl was rescued by Power Girl, and they were brought back to Sanctuary so Supergirl could heal. And then Power Girl and her being in the same space triggered an anti-clone alarm in Sanctuary. So this issue is just a treat. I'm just, I'm just, I like this issue. So... The alarm's still going off, and basically they're trying to reason with Sanctuary. They're like, Sanctuary, we're not clones. Like, clearly we are of different ages here. Just stop. And, like, it keeps on... They keep on treating it like it's a nagging child rather than being, like, an actual threat. Like, it's just like, no, like, remain still. This will only take a second. I would really like it if you played along here. And there's basically saying, like, look, she's a guest. She's Power Girl. We are clearly different, like... We're not clones. And she's like, well, you have the same genetic, like, fingerprint. So, look, I have nothing personal against the clone. And it's like, she's not a clone. Look, she's older. She's old. And Power Girl's like, old? And she's like, old, older. You know what? Sorry, I'm a little bit stressed right now. And also, you're probably a bit too old to wear the Power Girl outfit. And she's like, that was in your closet. What are you talking about? She's like, yeah, well, I never wore it. So, whatever. So, I love this here. Uh, since both of yourselves believe yourself to be the true Kara, a test must be implemented to determine which of you is in fact the real Kara. I suggest gladiatorial combat. Like, Sanctuary's voice is so good in this book. And they're like, what? No, we're not going to do that. And he's like, fine, I guess I'll just scan you. Stupid. So he pulls down some scanners. And Supergirl's like, look, I'm sorry about this. I'm sorry that he thinks you're a clone. I just... I'm I'm happy that you got me. Like we'll we'll we're we can be friends. Like there's no reason that we have to fight. And if I'm going to grow into even half the woman as you, then I'll consider that a success. So they say, yeah, no, like we're good, we're all cool. And the scan finishes up, and Sanctuary is like, oh, hey, you were right. She's not the clone. You are. And Carl's like, oh dear God. Okay, this is just going to be a whole thing, isn't it? So at that point, uh, she. Power Girl's like, Sanctuary. I mean, you gotta listen to me now, right? This is unacceptable. And Supergirl's like, you know what? No, this may as well just happen. Like, I, I lost my planet, and then, like, I trusted hell. That was stupid. And then I got a kryptonite point. Like, all of this, you know, it may as well just happen that my own house thinks I'm a clone. So, sure, whatever. Yeah, may as well. And she keeps on saying, like, Sanctuary made a mistake, and Sanctuary keeps chiming in, like, uh, I didn't, I'm, I'm like, 100% sure I, I'm not making a mistake. And then she's like, whatever, look, I don't know what's happening. Maybe this is something with Sanctuary. Maybe you did something to my house while I was unconscious. And Power Girl's like, seriously? You think I would do so? I'm the one who saved you. And she's like, yeah, and I don't know why you saved me. Like, I'm not blaming you. I'm saying it's just possible. That's all I'm saying. And Supergirl's like, look, it's it's it doesn't matter. Like, whatever's going to happen is just going to happen now. And Power Girl's like, no, you're accusing me of doing that. Like, that's not okay. Like, even if you aren't blaming me, it's not okay that you're accusing me of it. And at this point, the sanctuary is like, uh, maybe the answer to all this is at the end of the hallway where the dematerialization room is. Maybe go down there. And they just keep yelling at sanctuary to shut up. Until finally, sanctuary sends out these drones and they look around and they're like, sanctuary, you've been off the quiet. What's going on? And sanctuary's like, oh, I realize you're not going to listen. So I'm sending out the muscle. And these drones all combine into this big uh, super drone. And it starts attacking Kara. Uh, Power Girl kicks it through a wall and it's like, nope, I, I said stop. You need to listen to me. And he's like, actually, the anti clone priority is over top of listening to you. I need to take care of any clones first. So. It starts zapping Kara. Uh, Kara uses heat vision in order to get it away. Uh, Power Girl's still trying to command it, and he's just like, no, I'm not going to listen to you, and he blasts her outside of Sanctuary so she can't get back in. And at that point, Supergirl's like, okay, why, why are you so big on saving me now? Like, what was all this enthusiasm when I was with Hell? And he's like, well, Hell wasn't a clone. Hell was an actual Kryptonian. You, however, are a clone, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and kill him and she's like okay well if i remember the hell stuff you know that i'm not a clone right like that's i, I was the real one then he's like no you could have been cloned back then too i just didn't know there were two of you so he 
baits her by saying like, oh, my super intelligence is stored in these beakers here. If you, if, if you truly distrust my thing, you got to test the beakers. And so she starts punching at the beakers, just like, yeah, well, you made a mistake in thinking I go down without a fight. And he's like, actually, I was baiting you. The beakers are filled with the thing that's going to bind you up and make you easier to kill. So thank you for punching them out. And she's like, God damn, you suck so much, Sanctuary. So at that point, she he basically tells her, like, look, it's so much better if you're dead. Like, look at all the crap you've gone through in just this past, like, year. Your life sucks. Let me kill you. And she's like, okay, that's, yeah, that's things, but I, I still want to be able to live. And car is outside, or sorry, power rolls outside, and... Sanctuary is like, it looks like you're trying to tell me something. Let me give you a little bit of air so you can say it. And she's like, look, I can explain Sanctuary. We're both real. I'm from, and if she's about to say another world, Sanctuary is like, actually, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Bye-bye. And Supergirl inside, about to be killed, tells Power Girl, freeze it. Freeze all of it. And so she flies up to the surface of the ocean, comes back down, making like a huge air tunnel uh, that the whole ocean's about to crash down on them. And she freezes it. And Kara, Sanctuary is like, that wasn't going to work. Like, I'm made of Kryptonian crystals. I'm super strong. You can't just freeze me and expect me to shatter. And she's like, no, but I do know that heating you after freezing is enough to shatter you if it's done fast enough. And she releases all of the energy in her body out to basically shatter Sanctuary in a big explosion. And Power Girl grabs Kara, drags her up to the ocean surface, and... She's like, oh, are you alive? Are you okay? You got to say something. And Supergirl wakes up and is like, I still think you're too old to wear that outfit. So then it cuts to miles above the earth. They're watching the sunrise over the horizon. It looks, it, it reminds them just ever so slightly from this height of a Kryptonian sunrise. And they're like, look, we can be friends. Like, we can be cool with each other. But right now, let's just not talk about it. Let's just watch the sunrise. So they do. And then we see down on the ocean floor, uh, the crystals start to reassemble into the robot again, which says, not Kara, eradicate. So entirely possible this becomes the New 52 version of the Eradicator, which I'm down for. If it keeps the voice, if it keeps this like snap, snarky little snappy dialogue, I love it. The writing in this was fantastic. I, I, don't, I don't think last issue was as snappily written. Or at least not as interestingly so. But Sanctuary in this issue, oh, like, mwah, chef's kiss. Love it. And the art does a great job as well. Um, I forget who it was. Mahmoud Azrar. Fantastic art in this. Coloring's great. Art's great. I, I, I really don't have anything negative to say about this issue. It's The only thing I could say is that it doesn't do much to, like advance any major plots. But there were no real major plots going on. I think the Lex Luthor stuff... Wasn't that it for, was that for him or for her? I don't know. I can't even remember. There's too many super books going on, but no, nah, it's, it's a good, just solid issue. So I'm going to give this one a, I'm going to give it a, a straight nine. Honestly, I think this is the best issue of Supergirl there's been yet. And I've been pretty high on this book in general. So yeah, nine for this. Good job getting it back after the hell on earth. Cause that is, that is a challenge. Justice League of America's Vibe, number four, written by Sterling Gates, art by Manuel Garcia and Fabiano Neves. So last issue, uh, Gypsy was being held in Argus detention cell or whatever. She managed to escape and Vi was just chilling in his bedroom and this dude showed up named Breacher and he's just in his room now. So we pick up this issue in Detroit with Agent Gunn coming home and he comes home to his husband. Turns out he's married. He is in a gay relationship. And his husband's like, oh, yeah, hey, how's it going? Here's this crazy thing that happened at work today. By the way, you forgot your wedding ring here. Is Like, are you, like, ashamed of me or something? Like, do we need to have that talk? And the husband's like, no, no, no. Look, there's been a lot of shakeups at Argus recently. And, like, the people in charge now are the sort of people who would use our marriage against me. And I just, I don't want you to be involved in that at all. And he's like, don't worry, I get it, but I'm going to risk it. So, you know, 
tell people we're married. It's okay. So then we cut back over to Vibe, and he's talking to Breacher. And Breacher's basically there, and he's like, hey, here's the deal. I'm here to help you. Don't don't try to vibe me or whatever. And he's like, okay, but, like, who are you? What's going on? And he's like, okay, this is all kind of confusing. I was the first to breach the dimensional main membrane. I came over to warn you guys of Darkseid's invasion. Nobody took me seriously, and now you guys are all, like, super paranoid or whatnot. So here's the thing. I just need you to listen. Argus ain't cool. It's not a good place. Be very cautious of them. And then all of a sudden he starts, like, glowing. He's being pulled back to his reality, and he disappears. So, and then Vibes is like, okay, well, uh, that's a lot to take in. So then we cut over to Gypsy, who's making her way in a downtown Detroit street fair, and she's looking at, like, some fabrics and stuff like that because she's just wearing, like, prison clothes, like bright orange, and some cops nearby are like, oh, we're we're to apprehend this woman. She's wearing these bright orange clothes. Should be easy to find her. And we see them walk by, like, a homeless couple on a bench, and it turns out one of them was Gypsy, just using her transforming ability to blend in so she manages to sneak by the cops she gets some uh clothes and stuff from the the fair and she actually pays for it and she even donates some money from selling the other stuff to uh a needy family so that nobody even has a bad word to say about her she was just super kind and nice the whole time so then we go down to the public library uh ramon is doing some investigation of the Argus and like how it's coming up in old newspapers and stuff. And they're like, yeah, Argus was made after like the whole dark side thing in order to help the justice league. But it sounds like they kind of folded in all of the men in black kind of government agencies. And so it's super secretive and stuff like that. And Dante times up to says, Cisco, like sounds to me like you're working for some real shady people. Maybe they're hurting people. So it's just like, you know, look into it. So we see the next mission come up, and Cisco's talking to Agent Gunn. He's like, oh, hey, you're married. I didn't even notice. Anyway, um, so how come every time we attack people, we attack them before talking to them? Like, this is my third mission, and it just seems like, you know, it's kind of weird like that. And I was like, okay, here's the thing. You remember that whole declaration of war that happened in, like, issue two? And he's like, yeah. Here's who it's for. And he pulls up Gypsy, and it's like, Gypsy is, like, this whole big thing, you need to go out there and find her. We know that she is somewhere in this fair. We've locked everybody in, and so you just need to go around and see if you can find her. And he's just like, okay, yeah, no, if it's to stop a war, sure, why not? And he also threatens his job, saying, like, you messed up the Kid Flash thing last issue, so you better be on this. So everyone's pissed off that they're being held against their will, but Cisco just goes around and is like, no, no, they're all good, they're fine, they're cool. Until finally he sees a young boy and he's glowing which is his cue of like you're not who you look like so gypsy transforms out starts running and she keeps on transforming into other people trying to throw the agents off the scent also the crowd is getting more and more rowdy as well because again everyone only had nice things to say about gypsy and so like ah okay the government's hunting nice people now so what if she can transform she's cool she gave money to the homeless so Someone throws a bottle, hits Agent Gunn in the head. Uh, Cisco makes his way and tries to follow her and is stopped by Batman. And Batman says, everybody, stand back. This is official Justice League business. Everyone, get out of here. Superman's dealing with her inside the building. And Cisco's like, dude, I can see you're not Batman. And she's like, fair enough. So he they try to fight each other. Uh, apparently, it's not a, an actual transformation It's just like a trick of the eye. She's able to bend light and fool the human eye into seeing different things. So he uses his vibe power to blast her into a nearby building. Some agents follow in. Uh, One of them is like, or Bob's like, hey, you guys chill here. I just want to like go deal with her myself. And they're like, no, no, no. We have orders to take her in like dead or alive. And, or sorry, especially alive. And so then Gypsy comes out, knocks out the agents uh vibe gives pursuit and basically he's like look no one's gonna hurt you we're, we're just here to figure out what's going on here and then waller pops over the comm and says like all right bring her in you got her and vibe's like okay guys so chill hold on 
And then she says, fire at will, which pisses off Vibe to the point where he uses his powers to basically make a hole in the floor and all the agents fall through. So now it's just him and Gypsy, and they're just talking now. And Vibe's like, look, why are you trying to start a war with Earth? And she's like, I'm not trying to start anything. Look, I come from like an interdimensional wandering tribe. I got left behind during one of their things, and I've been kept here as a prisoner ever since. Like, I just want to go home. And he's like, okay, well, where's the portal? And she's like, it moves... I, I, if I can figure out, like, where I was lost at, I can follow the path. And Vibe's like, okay, well, maybe I can find it for you. Like, that's kind of my whole thing. But first, let me... Right now, you're just showing up as a big ball of light, so let me just focus my vision a little bit. And, oh, hey, you're super hot. She's like, oh, okay, thanks. So he picks her up on his shoulder and is like, all right, so I'll, I'll help you out since you're clearly hurt. At this point, Waller and Gunn are able to hear everything over the comms, and Waller's like... What the hell is he doing, Gun? For God's sakes, get your... Like, he is going AWOL right now. He is helping the enemy. And Gun's like, nah, he's just he's just a kid. Like, I can still get him. I can still go get him. And he's just like, no. Time for that is well past. He is now an enemy. We, we, we're, we're done with him. We're going to bring him in as well as Gypsy. So, at that point, everyone uh, is told the new plan. As well as Waller saying, hey, everyone... You got that? Go find Vibe and Gypsy. And we see that it is the Suicide Squad being called in for another mission. Okay. I like the way this series is moving. I do enjoy the fact that Vibe is thinking more outside the lines of like, nope, it's my duty to just follow orders. I'm brought on to the JLA. Like, no. He, he sees that they are clearly bad dudes and he, he's doing something about it rather than him just hemming and hawing of do I listen to authority or do I do what's right? I appreciate that. The only critique I really have in this book is that I am so sick of things crossing over with Suicide Squad. From the beginning of this show, I feel like every single goddamn book that's floundering even a little bit is immediately thrown into a meetup with the Suicide Squad because they can just fit in wherever. This is just another mission for the squad. Stop it. I, I, it makes more sense here because it's Amanda Waller, but like I still don't want it. And the fact that this one teased the crossover with Batman, despite the fact that didn't happen, last issue was Kid Flash. I just, I don't feel like they have any faith in this book. And if they just really let the story play out, it could end up so cool. Like this whole Breacher thing at the beginning, super interesting that there's this other dimensional being that's trying to help out. I'm so in for that. It's, Stop crossing over with Suicide Squad. So yeah, overall, I'm going to give this one just a flat 7. It's fine, it's good, it's not amazing, but it's it has so much promise. And I like the way they're also playing with Gypsy as well. So 7 for this. Look forward to seeing the next chapter. Wonder Woman number 20, written by Brian Azzarello, art by Cliff Chang and Goran Suzuka. So last issue, we just had a bunch of like planning and stuff like that. And the end was Firstborn made a deal with Poseidon to go after the baby. And Artemis was showing up to attack Zola and the baby. So yeah, a lot of people going after the baby now. So we pick up with Apollo on his rooftop of Olympus. And he's just like, look, I want a new era. I don't want this. I want this to be enlightened, not trial by blood and all that. I want us to be able to talk through our problems. And Poseidon shows up and he's just like, what did you do to Olympus? This sucks. You suck. And basically Apollo is just like, look, here's the thing. It's a chime for change. I'm in charge now. This is me. And I'm going to take care of the little prophecy baby already. Like, it's already handled. And Poseidon just laughs, and he's just like, oh, and you said you were enlightened. So then we cut over to Zola. We have officially decided that the name of the baby is Zeke. So that's a thing. And as she's trying to put the baby down for bed, uh, Artemis busts in just like, hey, can I hold my little baby brother? And Wonder Woman hears the boom, comes in, sees Artemis there, and... Basically, she's like, hey, look, you made a deal. If that baby was going to be the baby of prophecy, we had to kill it. 
we're going to kill it. And she's like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. And it's like, all right, well, then I'm going to kill it. It's like, okay, well, that's uh, we're not going to do that. So immediately Wonder Woman and Apollo, or Artemis, get into a fight. So Zola runs out, meets up with uh, Ares and Hera, and just like, oh, they're coming for my baby. What are we going to do? How we we got to save it. We got to go fix it. And Lennox steps up and is just like, hand me the baby. I'm, like, literally invulnerable. I will be able to protect it. And we see the battle between... Artemis and Wonder Woman over London. Artemis is just like, hey, take off those gauntlets like you did before and just let loose, man. Like, we got a big, this is a god fight. Like, fight like a god. And Wonder Woman's like, no, no, no. We're in the middle of London. Like, we're, we will hurt people. I don't want to do that. And she's like, well, I don't care about hurting these people. So I'm going to win this one if you're not willing to do what's necessary. And she throws like some weird moonbeam stuff which comes down and explodes the apartment that they were just in. Also, war seemingly was directly hit. So at that point, there's chaos on the ground. They're trying to outrun these moonbeams. And they're like, okay, moon's flying up top there. We got to get underground. So they head down to a uh, subway. And uh, Zola tells Lennox, like, we can't just leave Diana. She'll die up there. We we can't just leave her. And he's just like, I'm not gonna. Like, I'm, I'm planning to go and help her but you need to take the like i have to protect this baby because you're not able to so take the baby get underground and then i'll go help diana so we see the fight uh going on diana's pissed that the apartment exploded thinking that all of her friends are now dead and uh, artemis just throws a punch throws her down and we see that Wonder Woman has sneakily put her lasso around Artemis during this point. And she's just like, oh, what, you're going to try to pull me down? Yeah, tell me how that works out when you're unwilling to use your full strength. And she's like, no, I'm not going to pull you down. And she sees them fighting against each other. She's like, you're pulling me up. And then she just gives and lets the full strength of Artemis pull her up at, like, supersonic speed to deliver a super strong punch right into Artemis's face. Knocks her into a daze. Wonder Woman uses her lasso, throws her around, hits her super hard into the ground. And Artemis is just like, why won't you use your power, Amazon? You got so much of it. And she's just like, because I don't need it to win. Like, I, I can just use my brains to beat you instead. So she's about to knock out Artemis and uh, Ares grabs her hand. And she's like, that's enough. She's beaten. I'll take care of her. I'll deal with her. You go take care of uh, Zola and the baby because they need your help right now more than ever. So Ares then picks up Artemis. We cut back to the rooftop of Olympus. And basically Poseidon is chewing out Apollo for thinking he earned this. Like it was kind of just given to him. And he's like, no, no, no. Like you threatened to marry Hera and she still didn't want you. Like you're the worst. Nobody thinks you're strong. You're just ending up with this in the meantime until the prophecy happens and at that point Ares comes in with the knocked out body of artemis and just like here you go i told you guys to stay out of my business and this is how you repay things and apollo calls him out for being sided with wonder woman and he's just like yeah okay sure whatever but point being get out stay out of my way and then poseidon starts laughing he's like none of you understand this baby is not the child of prophecy. I looked at the child of prophecy, the one who's going to kill them all. He is coming for your throne, Apollo. And unlike this baby, he can't be stopped. And at this point, we see Lennox and the crew making their way in the downtown of London. And as they reach the end of an alley, they come across Firstborn, and her name is Cassandra. I'm sure I may have known that before, but I'm finally locking it in. And turns out they recognize Cassandra, and Hera recognizes the firstborn, and she's like, oh, this isn't good. So Cassandra introduces herself to Zola, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, no, Lennox is my brother. I am also a child of Zeus, but my special ability was I was, I had a voice that, like, could persuade people to do things. And Lennox is like, yeah, and she used that ability to have, th- how many? 20? 30? 20? A dozen? Forty. Forty people kill themselves just on a whim. And so he ripped out Cassandra's throat. And she's just like, all right, well, that wasn't your place to do that. Now, was it? And Firstborn's like, all right, this is stupid. Enough with the words. Let's fight. And Lennox is like, oh, yeah, finally, I'm in. So 
Next issue, Lennox almost certainly dies. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing Firstborn actually go up in a fight here. That being said, now that we know Cassandra is also a daughter of Zeus, I'm actually I'm more interested. I, re I Obviously, her power set, which was her voice, is a bit gone, but she, I'm sure she has some level of super strength still. There has to be more to it than just, I had a good voice. So I'm looking forward to that as well. It's, it's managed to get me interested in this character just with like a single panel of saying you killed 40 people by just telling them to. That's super interesting from a character perspective. Um, Art-wise, everything's good. Nothing really stood out. I don't know where the art transition was, so it was super nice throughout. Um, don't really have much more to say about it, so I'm just going to say that this one is a 7.5. And I look, I, I do want to say... They do Artemis so dirty in this book. Not just this issue, but like the title as a whole. Artemis just, as goddess of the hunt, she cannot win any of these battles. They're doing her so dirty. But regardless, I enjoy it. So yeah, 7.5. Legion of Superheroes number 20, written by Paul Levitz and Keith Giffen, art by Francis Portella. So last issue, I mean, there was a lot. There was like six different plots, but a big one was mon -El was taken out by Emerald Empress, and one of the gangs was brought over to Glorith's, like, sorcerer world. That happened. So this issue picks up in Sorcerer's, Sorcerer's world, and like they're like, hey, if you could teleport like any time, why don't you use teleporting more often? And it's like, well, I can only teleport here, says Glorith. Also, let's go find my mom. So they fly off and they're looking for a place. And immediately this world doesn't have any technology relying on the quark relays, apparently, though it does start still falling apart for some reason. And so they're like, oh, this isn't safe either. So Ultra Boy hops onto Chameleon lad i always forget with his lad boy guy chameleon lad's back and they fly across the sea to where the mother supposedly is cut to the promethean giant where phantom girl is the only one left alive out of her team that arrived there and the finger of the phantom or the promethean giant is like chasing after her as she runs down the streets and she's like, I've lost all my team. Everything sucks. I got to get out of here even if it means never coming back. And so she starts to fade out of existence and she says, goodbye, Joe. So I think that means like she's going back to her own dimension because she did come from a different dimension. I don't know. It doesn't explain it. So then we see uh, invisible guy, Jacques and Polar guy, and they are in some weird like foggy realm and it's like wait a minute hold on we're not dead dead we're still here but this may also be not the land of the living and the invisible guy's like oh yeah i i've been in this place before and i had to spend some time here among the people who have died and we see what i assume are some old legionnaires that are dead and polar kids like what so we see Glorith arrives. He, she uh, hugs a guy named Block, who I guess is like, I don't know, a guy that watches after the sorcerers or whatnot. And he's like, what are you doing here? I, you didn't get summoned. He's just like, yeah, no, I showed up. Is, everything's going nuts around the universe. And Block's like, yeah, your mom's kind of casting a spell to keep the planet together. Ain't going so hot. So I doubt she can help you. And then the mom turns around like, yeah, and I can use some help if you want to like do anything here. So... Chameleon Lad tries to explain, like, yeah, something's going on. It's probably affecting a bunch of other planets, considering that our, like, entire comms are down. I don't know what's going on. And Sorcerer, or sorry, Black Witch is like, yeah, no, like, the whole universe is feeling this. And even a lot of your friends are already dead. So just letting you know. And then she casts, like, a spell saying, on our planet, we don't have that tech or whatever. But what we do have is this monster and she shows it, and it's Validus, as everyone immediately recognizes. And it's like, yeah, no. Also, here's some images of, like, your friends who are dead. And one's like, oh, no, Sun Boy. He's, he was, his head was crushed. Oh, Jesus, that's so brutal. So, yeah. At that point, we cut back to the giant. We see that it stopped dragging its finger. And Therok, who is inside, 
is like, oh, I must have killed her. I don't sense her presence anymore. That's freaking great. I'm so happy to have killed her. Anyway, I'm going to go check on uh, uh, the last of our Fatal Five because we have Emerald Empress, we have Persuader, we have Therok, and we have Validus. But we don't actually see who the fifth one is, and they say, like, oh, and the fifth one's even the most dangerous. So, real quick, though, he makes a pit stop over to Validus, and he's like, hey, Validus, crawl into the center of this world and grab their magic rock, because that's the key of their magic. He's on the Sorcerer's World, if that wasn't clear, because it wasn't. Um, so we see, as Therok leaves Validus to go do that, Validus goes up to the magic rock, but there's a magic shield in the way. Black Witch and the Legionnaires are in the way. And is like, back, you beast. We, will, we won't let you destroy this world. And Validus starts just attacking them. There's a whole fight scene here where Ultra Boy like, throws a punch and barely does anything. Block jumps in and tackles him into some lava. And then we cut over to uh, Brainiac 5's team, who's still taking care of mon -El. And basically they're just kind of like reasoning this out they're like okay so yeah there's like emerald empress she left it's fatal five but we don't know who the fifth member is who could be so dangerous what nightmare could this fifth member of the fatal five be so then we go back to the fight with validus and black witch is like okay here's the thing i can't stop him he is too strong but together our powers combined we can be captain planet and so they combine their magic spells and f put up like an extra shield around the thing to stop Validus's like immediate attack. And Black Witch is like, join your power with me and we can we can save the world. And they cast their spell as Validus is about to jump in after them. And it looks as though they either teleported the entirety of Sorcerer's World or they teleported Validus. But regardless, he's now in the middle of nothing and he's just floating in space. And they're like, haha, Validus, you won't be found for at least like 300 years. Anyway, bye. So that's just gone. We see, because of the teleportation, Chameleon Lad and Ultra Boy did not teleport with. They got dropped back off on Earth, and they actually ended up in the wreckage of the Legion headquarters. And they're like, oh, crap, this place is gone. Oh, what are we supposed to do? And they hear a voice from above saying, hey, boys, it's your turn now. And they see it is Persuader, who is standing on the dead body of Duplicate Damsel. So, yep, that's the issue. That's what happened. Okay, I, I appreciate the fact that I can feel, over the past like three or four issues, this rising tension. It is a plot where things are getting worse. And I feel that. My issue still becomes... I don't feel like I know the stakes well enough. I feel that there are stakes, and that's good, but they've never really ascribed to me of, okay, what is actually the issue here? Because, yeah, okay, the tech doesn't work, and that's major bad for the entirety of the universe. Got that. No problem. But, like, how bad is it? I still haven't gotten that. Sure, it's like natural disasters out everywhere, and everything's going crazy, but, like, is this the equivalent of, like, an EMP bomb on the planet Earth just ruining all technology forever? Or is this, like, you know, the Internet is out for a while and all it will really take is a bit of reorganization once things come back? It seems like with all the death and stuff, it's the former, but I haven't gotten that from the story. Like, I don't know how universal this is spread because it is just a couple of planets. So I think it's not doing a good job of really selling the threat of the Fatal Five as well as they could, but maybe that's just because I'm also not attached to the villains either. They keep on talking like, oh no, it's Validus, but like, who the hell is Validus? They don't even explain. They're just, oh, he's a big hulking monster guy and he beats up everybody. Tell me more. I'm interested. I want to know. Stop just going over everything else. So yeah, I'm going to give this one a... I'll give it a six. I will I will say it's better than average. It's better than this book's average for sure. But it does still have many issues with it. And I'm looking forward to seeing if they can pull it out in these last, like, three issues. But, yeah, it's, it hasn't before, so I have reason to think it won't again. Yeah. 
Sword of Sorcery, number eight, written by Christy Marks, art by Aaron Lepresti and Travis Moore. This is the finale of the book. I'm going to miss it, but first, last issue we had Eclipso taking the House of Diamond and basically joining it to his cause, and they all started to attack of House Amethyst. So this picks up with, uh, what's her name? Gracial is the good one, so Mordial is being greeted by the head of House Diamond, and he's just like, hey, we got you surrounded. We've taken over House Onyx and House Diamond. Like, they're all coming after you, and he can literally use his power to change the will of your own people. Do you surrender? And she's like, you're a traitor and a coward, and no, of course we're not going to surrender. And he's like, well, screw you, I'm out. And so he storms out. We see... Back at the House of Turquoise, Ingvi comes through from dropping off her brother and stuff into hiding because Eclipso is there. And she's like, okay, there's like a lot of crazy stuff going on. But the number one thing is we got to get to House Amethyst because they are definitely attacking there. And they're like, okay, but there's no portal. They closed all the portals in there. How are we supposed to do that? And the head of House Onyx, Lady Akikra, comes out and just be like, hey, I got like special shadows, portals and stuff like that. We can get you in. And they're like, why should we trust House Onyx? This guy came from your house. And he's like, yeah, and he killed my house. He took them over. I am not fond of this man. And coming through vouching is also, um, oh, what's his name? Hadron from House Diamond. He's like, yeah, no, she saved my life because my brother is a dick. So um, we're good. We're, we're cool if you trust us at all. And they say, okay, but like, we are probably all going to die if we go do this. So is everyone still good? And they're like, yeah, no. Also, by the way, this is the new head of House Turquoise. He's definitely coming along. And Turquoise is like, I mean, yeah, I am. But, like, why you got to? It's, it's death. Also, our big muscle guy here, the one who acts as the bodyguard for Amethyst, he doesn't have blood power. He could be affected by Eclipse. So I don't think we should bring him through because he'd be scary to try to fight. And... He's like, actually, I do have a latent power of a house in my blood. So I do have blood powers, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. That's you. That'll come up in the next issue. Oops. So at that point, they all make their way through the portal and say, all right, let's go do it. So uh, Eclipso is like, yeah, no, I knew she would decline the peace offer. But hey, that's just all the more reason to go ahead and fight. So she you, he takes over the will of the guards of house amethyst so they open up the gate and let them in and then he's just like all right destroy the house of amethyst and mordial comes out and starts fighting against her own guards because of course she has to try to defend herself she is about to get overrun when all of a sudden a wall of amethyst comes up she recognizes it as her sister and standing up on the the palace steps is the whole gang and they're like yep we, we're we have to join forces so i hope you're okay with that in order to take down this monster and we see, while they've got just a second to talk, while the wall is up, before they can break through it, uh, they say, okay, Ingvi, how do we beat this guy? And she comes up with this memory of using the Amethyst Catalyst to force him back into the diamond. So they say, okay, we'll do that. You all fight down here, do that. Gracio and Mordial, they're going to go up and they're going to power up the... Um, the catalyst with all their power, but it requires them to get the black diamond away from Eclipso for it to work. So Amethyst comes up with a sneaky plan for that. So anyway, Eclipso comes in. He immediately just starts bashing down the Amethyst wall and she says, all right, everybody, this is it. Like everyone knows what the plan here is. Let's do it. And Eclipso bursts down the Amethyst wall. They start sword fighting. Everyone takes a partner uh the prince is fighting against his brother who betrayed him amethyst is fighting against eclipso it's just a whole big battle scene we see grace and mordial make their way up to the roof and basically they're just like bickering with each other just being like oh man i can't believe that we're fighting side by side this is this is crazy and grace feels like well i mean it could have always been this way if you weren't such a bitch so let's go ahead and just let bygones be bygones for right now and we see in the middle of the fight, um, Amaya realizes that Eclipso is kind of weak 
to amethyst shards so she tosses away the sword she had and makes one of pure amethyst as she does so she gets jumped from behind by one of amethyst or one of eclipso's goons and she tosses him into eclipso and then they continue fighting and it's only afterwards that it's revealed that the goon was actually preet the turquoise guy in disguise and he used that collision with Eclipso to pick his pocket and steal the Black Diamond off of him. So now that the Black Diamond has been separated from Eclipso, they activate the catalyst and they use that to put Eclipso back into the diamond. However, Eclipso says, I don't want to go back. So he uses his super-powered vision to blow up the catalyst on top of Gracial and Morgil. And then he goes after Amaya with his sword, saying, like, I'm going to kill all you amethysts so that I can never go back again. And uh, as Gracie and Morgil are trapped underneath the shards of the catalyst, they reach out, touch hands with each other, and they give all of their amethyst power to Amaya. And so she is given the full strength of the blood power rather than just a third of it. And she that starts, like, overwhelming her senses. We cut over to the dickhead Diamond Brother is about to attack Rayshan, I think it is, no, Hadron, and the big bodyguard guy shows up and just takes him out from behind, just clubbed to the head. So all the rest of the army starts snapping out of it. Everyone's out from Eclipso's curse because he is forced to put all of his effort into fighting against Amaya with her new blood power, and she thinks her mother and aunt are dead because that's the only way she's seen blood power transfer like that, so... She assumes they died in the explosion. She starts going at Eclipso full force, and she's like, I'm not going to let you win. And she holds up the Black Diamond, and he's like, you can't do anything without the Catalyst. And I blew it up. And she says, nah, I am the Catalyst now. So she uses all of her energy to take Eclipso back into the Diamond, and yeah, that's it. He's back in. However, as he goes back in, the Diamond seemingly just explodes in a light, it goes, it's no longer there. And Amaya's like, oh, cool, I destroyed it. And Envy's like, no, no, I don't think you did. I think that that's still out there somewhere. And, you know, the uh, prince of House Diamond steps up to Amaya being like, ah, I, I offer my life and my sword to your house. You saved our lives. And he's like, I, I don't want to be Lady Amaya. I want to be, I want to be princess again. I want someone else to be in charge. And then we see that Grace and Morgel did both survive. They no longer have their blood power, obviously, but they do uh, come down and they say, oh, my, it's so great to see you. Even Morgel is like, I wouldn't have done it if there were any other way. But she hugs her aunt and is like, oh, I'm so happy, Aunt Morgel. So anyway, Envy makes the obvious point of like, hey, the diamond ain't here. It could be anywhere in the realm and could also be back on normal Earth. So we got to deal with that. And also, he'll come back into power as soon as there's another eclipse. And... Mordred points out, like, okay, well, how long is that? And he's like, that's like five months. So they say, all right, well, we're going to go make sure that monster never gets released again. And we see the whole team pose for a picture that nobody's taking. The end, question mark? Unfortunately, yes, it is the end. We did not get more of Amethyst until, like, I think eight years later. It was a while. It took a long time. And even then, it didn't continue this story. So I'm sure we'll see Amethyst pop up in other books, but... I'm going to miss this particular one. It had a certain flair to it. I like all the different houses with the different powers. I will say turning it to Eclipso in the end didn't quite feel like the way they were meaning to go. But because they just had to wrap up super quick, they're like, all right, guess we're doing this now. So cut short in its prime. I very much enjoyed it. I'd give this particular issue a... I'd give it just a flat eight. It didn't quite hit as strong of an ending because it was just a like, no, now I'm even more powerful. Like, it was good. It just wasn't great. So eight for this. I really did enjoy the series, though. Highly recommend you check out if possible. So yeah, Sword of Sorcery. Great book. Stalker, written by Mark Andreco, art by Andre Bresson. So this is the backup story from Sword of Sorcery number four through seven, I think. I could be wrong on the exact numbers, but regardless, uh, this story is all about a 
long ago, a young warrior king, he showed up to battle and he just killed everybody. He was so good at battling and he was very religious. He was very all up on God. And so he was coming home one day. His devotion to his family was unparalleled. And when he arrived home to tell his wife about all of his things, she was super sick. She had the black fever and she was not going to make it. And she was pregnant as well. And Stalker's just like, no, I, I, I literally cannot lose you. That will break me. So I will do anything it takes. And so he goes down to the chapel and he's praying to his God. And God's not responding in any meaningful way. And at that point, uh, someone in Dark Hood comes up, just like, hmm, maybe God isn't listening. And Stalker's like, I'm sorry, you blasphemer. What was that? And he's like, I'm just saying, maybe I could uh, give you some help. I, because God's not here, I'm willing to give you whatever you need. And Stalker's like, if you can save my wife, then by all means, yeah, my, I'll give you whatever you want. And he's like, oh, you know, all I want is a soul born into a powerful bloodline. Do you know where I could find one of those? And he's like, oh, I'm, I have a soul born into a powerful bloodline. Okay. And he's like, all right, then here's the deal. I will save your wife from this fever in exchange for her soul. Got it? Cool. So they shake hands. And with that, the deal was struck. And immediately his wife gets all better. And they frolic for a few months until she gives birth. And then she dies in childbirth. And Stalker's like, no, I, we said she'd be okay, what? And he doesn't even want to see the baby that survived, just says, send it away, I don't need it. So he tracks down the quote-unquote wizard that made the deal, and he's like, you lied to me. He's like, nah, I said I'd cure her of the fever. That I did, and then she just happened to die because of some other things. She wasn't immortal, unlike you. And he's like, what do you mean, unlike me? He's like, well, I'm making you immortal. Because you are going to do stuff for me. You're going to, uh, one day, you and I made a bargain. So I will come back to collect eventually. But for now, you're going to be immortal. And he's like, fine, whatever. So the ages go on. He feels soulless because, yeah, he sold his soul. And he goes around just like killing for whatever reason. And finally, you know, he reaches modern day and he's essentially just like a hitman. He takes jobs. He doesn't care to know who it is. He just kills them. Uh, but when he gets the money for it, he just passes it off because it's never been about the money either. He's just a wanderer. So finally, he enters a bar and inside waiting is the wizard from before. But it turns out it wasn't a wizard. It was a demon. And it wasn't any demon. It's just straight up Lucifer. So Lucifer is like, hey. I got a job for you now, finally going to collect. And Stalker sits down. He's like, you got two minutes. He's like, oh, seriously? Like, I'm Lucifer, and you're telling me I have two minutes? And Stalker's like, one and a half. And he's like, fine, whatever. Uh, here's an image of the girl. I want you, she has something that belongs to me. I'd like you to find her. And he's like, none of your demons can find her? And he's like, actually, no. Surprisingly, they are not capable of doing so. So go find her. We got over to a laundromat where we see this woman has been staying because she's homeless. She fell asleep in there. She's getting kicked out by the owner, though, back onto the street. And we see Stalker say, like, okay, now what do I get out of this? And he's like, what do you mean? I finally collect your soul. That's it. That's, or no, sorry, you get your soul back. That's what it is. You get your soul back, and then you're allowed to finally die. And he's like, fine, all right, whatever. So he bails out. And within, like, minutes, he finds this girl. He tracks her down. Uh, she puts up a little bit of a fight, but then Stalker ends up getting the upper hand and just being like, all right, I got you, and you're pregnant. Oh, God, you're pregnant. And you look a lot like my wife. Oh, geez, Lucifer, you're, you're, this is messed up, man. And Lucifer shows up, and he's like, I know, right? Also, that was ridiculously quickly. How did you find her that fast? No matter. Probably something to do with your bloodline, because she's actually the, like, great, great, great to the power of, like, 14 child of yours. So, like, this is your descendant. And, uh, honestly, I don't really care for her that much. I just care about her offspring. And she's actually going to labor at that moment. She's like, oh, God, the baby's coming. So, at that point, Lucifer's like, you done great. So let's just wait until she has a baby, and then I'll give you back your soul. And Stalker's like, nah, I've suddenly got a conscious. So he uses magic to blow away Lucifer and the gang of all these demons and he takes the woman and manages to start to escape 
And the rest of this is basically just one long chase scene. Uh, they make their way back to uh, Stalker's home, which is just a complete wreck. And he's like, hey, look, I, I know magic, but like it takes a lot out of me. I just, I'm not going to be able to do that again. If you're going to have the baby, like have it now. And so she starts going into labor. Of course, Lucifer and all the demons show up and just be like, hey, look, I get it. I hit you with a lot. I'm willing to forget about your attacking me if you just let me have the baby now. And turns out she has the baby. She gives birth and he goes to protect it. One of the he uses magic to blow the brains out of a demon, and Lucifer gets pissed because it gets on his Armani. Uh, she he hands the baby back to her, his mother, and then he starts throwing off as many magic spells as he can for just defensive purposes. Turns out though, the mother also died in childbirth, because of course it did, and the baby's still all right though. So he picks up the baby and a gun, and he just starts charging at Lucifer. He's like, all right, you want the baby? Come get it. He starts firing off shots at the demons. Of course, it doesn't kill them because they're demons, but he manages to do some parkour over rooftops until he gets a safe distance away. Then he conjures up a bunch of portals, casts his blood through all of them, so that way they won't know which one's the one they actually went through, and then they all blink out of existence. So he pops out at a store, picks up some supplies he's going to need, and... He goes to the house of a nearby priest and he knocks, he forces him at gunpoint to join him uh, down at a nearby church. And he's like, OK, you know what the plan is. I've explained it already. Let's do this. And he starts drawing like salt circles and stuff like that. Of course, Lucifer was not going to be that far behind. So he enters into the church, which apparently this church has not been consecrated. It's like an either really new or really old. Hard to tell. And he walks in and he's like, hey, you going to give me that baby? And he's like, you mean my kin? He's like, now you care? Dude, you gave up your actual son. You're a dick. Why would you care about it? And he's like, fine, yeah, okay. But that's changing today. I'm going to be cool now. And Lucifer's like, dude, you didn't even pick a consecrated church. I can just come up and get you. And at that point, he cues the priest, and the priest consecrates the church with Lucifer inside of it, which causes him an intense amount of pain. So he charges after Stalker, falls right into the salt circle, and is like, ha-ha, now I've trapped you, Lucifer. And Lucifer's like, yeah, from, like, leaving, but not from using my abilities. Hey, priest, go give me that kid. And the priest picks up the baby. He's like, I really don't want to do this. Don't make me. And as Stalker's trying to attack Lucifer, he's just batting him away. Uh, priest hands the baby over to Lucifer, gets his neck snapped, and Lucifer's like, all right, I got the baby. I'm going to go ahead and tell you the cool thing now. Um, you never owed me your soul. Remember my exact words? I wanted a soul from a powerful bloodline. The baby, that's the soul I'm taking. You, you were just, you were fine. You had nothing, you literally did nothing. And you killed all those people for no reason. Bet you feel sheepish. So... At that point, Stalker, like, all the souls he's taken, like, catch up to him. And he's like, no, oh, God, the guilt is driving me mad. And Lucifer's like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm going to go back to hell. I'm taking the baby. Uh, bye. And as he's about to go through the hell portal, Stalker tackles him, gets him to drop the baby, and they both go through the portal. And Lucifer's like, you have no idea what you've done, but this is not over yet. And when Stalker wakes up, he's in a new area with a bunch of people with swords we don't get an explanation as to where but we see the baby is picked up by a firefighter who responded to a church fire and as he picks up the baby the baby throws out a super demonic looking glance at the camera and the end question mark yeah yeah i think it's the end so it's an okay backup i think i can see the points where each chapter split up it's not a bad story being told but I can definitely see why this one was never going to get itself a full title. It's an interesting concept, but like, how far can you really take it of a immortal hitman? Like, it's interesting right up until the things that were actually just revealed in this comic get revealed. Because this is the only twist that there is. It's like, actually, your soul was always there. Unless the rest of the book would be something of... He is trying to atone for his sins. That's the only thing I could think of. But then that just sounds like Phantom Stranger. So 
I get why he's not given his own book, especially because he's like a Z-tier character. So this particular one, art style was hit or miss. Uh, I think the demons were done really well, but the actual people were a little bit eh. So I'm going to say this one's probably like overall a 6.5. It's good. It's not great, but it is above average. So take that for what you will. That's it. That's all the comments came out from DC Comics this May 15th, 2013. And don't you click away. Don't turn me off. I have I have things. I have many things I need to tell you real quick. And more so than just where my Twitter is. So next week, Jeff Johns decided, hey, I'm actually going to submit everything I owe. Because, I don't know, they're checking final grades at this point. And so he is wrapping up. His Green Lantern saga next week. Issue 20 of Green Lantern is coming out. With it is Green Lantern New Guardians and Red Lantern's number 20. Both those. All, all this on this one week. So it's already a big week. It's a big event-filled week. But because Jeff Johns decided to submit everything at once, this week has 16 comics for me to talk about. Now, 16 is not out of the realm of possibility. But the fact that Green Lantern as a whole is wrapping up, as well as the Fury of Firestorm and Savage Hawkman, as well as we're getting a new number one in Green Teen, Teen Trillionaires, all of that is happening next week. That episode will be much longer than two hours. There's just no way around that. It's just the worst. And Jeff John submitted Aquaman and Justice League to come out. We've also got Flash, Batman Incorporated, Batman the Dark Knight, Talon, Superman, uh, Savage Hawk. No, I said that one. All-Star Western, Teen Titans, and Justice League Dark. It's a lot. There's a lot going on. So I am just going to open up next week's episode basically grunting and then just getting into the comics. And I will end next week's episode by screaming and ending the episode. So just to give you a bit of awareness as to what that means, that's what's going to happen. Maybe not exactly, but pretty damn close. Anyway, now that you know all that, I also want to just say after that week will be a fifth week. And for anyone who knows this show, on fifth weeks, we talk about backup comics as well as everything that actually did come out that week, which is like four annuals and then JLA, because Jeff Johns didn't submit everything on time. So, yes, that's what's going to be happening and why the next two weeks will suck so hard. Additionally, behind the scenes, I have to go to a family wedding, which is just throwing my whole schedule off. So inconsiderate of them, you know, to have a wedding when I need to film. Just rude. Anyway, that's really going to do it for me. Let me just go ahead and share. We have stuff. If you have thoughts, we have stuff. We have Twitters and Discords and Patreons and subreddits. Check all that out. It's in the description. That's really all I have to say. That's it. I'm done. My voice is not okay. I have been talking too much today. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to wrap up now as ungracefully as humanly possible. So thank you very much for watching, listening, consuming this podcast, have you to do. Give it the thumbs up and the stars and I don't know. What are we using nowadays? vibes give me your vibes so thank you very much for watching tune in next time and as always if it ain't broke don't fix it <laughs>